Hey everybody, this is the first episode back after a little while. So if you listen back and you're like, that seems kind of rusty. It's because I am. Also for some reason my audio, it's really bad in this one. Um, but I hope that doesn't obstruct your enjoyment too much because this conversation was just really nice. One of those ones where I walk away with a big smile on my face. So enjoy. My name is Peter Atencio. I'm a director, producer, writer, try to do a little bit of everything, uh, living in Los Angeles, California. What are the three things you value most in life? Wow. Uh, we go from a really, a really easy one to a really big one. Oh, and I knocked my computer off. Um, what are the three things I value most in life? Okay, let me, let me think for a second. I would say the first thing that just comes to mind, and I'll just go with like what jumps into my mind is uh, uh, laughter. And, and I don't mean like specifically just like the act of laughing. I mean like, like laughing at life. Cause I think life is sort of like inherently painful and terrible in a lot of ways. <laughs> and so you have to really find kind of the joy where you can. Um, so I, I tend to be something of a, of a negative person sometimes. So um, a big thing that I try to remind myself is take a step back and try to laugh at a situation because um, we're all just stupid monkeys just putting on a show and like nothing really matters. And so um, whenever I'm really bummed out about something or things are just hitting me hard I, I have to like take a step back and just try to laugh at something um that's one okay two um my family is very important to me my family is definitely a value for me um I have a, a wife and a five-year-old son and uh they just mean the world to me and so um a lot of what I do I I do for and because of them um and then uh, the third value for me, uh, you know, I, I think for me, it's just creativity. Like I strive to be creative every day, uh, however I can. I, I, I just, to me, it makes me feel more alive than anything else that I do. Um, and so even if it's like a small stupid way or just in the course of my job I'm, I'm always trying to look for a way like how can I be more creative with that how can I take a step back and um yeah and and just add creativity or or, or just exercise that muscle because for me it's kind of like a it's it's a muscle that you have to like work out all the time um or it falls off <laughs> so. Um, yeah, those are, those are the three that come to mind. I would be very curious because that is a big question. I'm very curious on what your values are. What your... So these change a lot. Okay. I, this show has been going now for, for two years, been asking those questions for two years and they change based on the events of my life. I think I'll talk like, there's a question later on about death, not to be spoiled, spoil anything, but, um, I think that like, the time not so much my individual family members because like everyone can piss people off at times they're like you love people but they annoy you sure um, the the first thing i'm going to say is the individual happy times that one has with their family like those special memories you can think back and you can have part and be like wow this thing for me is an incredible like my granddad passed away a couple of weeks ago oh, I'm um, sorry. And that was really hard because my granddad was the sort of person that it was very difficult to have a negative relationship with. He was a very religious man, and I'm not, but so we clashed over that. But like um, a couple of weeks before he died, I was able to go into hospital to see him. And we had this amazing conversation. And that was kind of the last real conversation I had. But that memory, the value that I have on that memory is unspeakable. And I think if I look back and, and think back on like even friends I don't speak to anymore for circumstantial reasons, or just drifting away, you look at that and you're like, wow, this is this is meaningful. Those little kernels of memory. Yeah. And or and I think the second thing is going to build on the first thing, which is 
that feeling when you know you're making one of those memories when you're yeah. in a moment and everything seems to coalesce perfectly and remind you you are alive um that's incredible and i think that ties into one and, and like one and two tied together um the most common answer this show gets that question gets is food um, really yeah yeah for people like value food a lot because i think it's like it's the, the thing that's necessary but i don't know if that's yeah. going to be <laughs> I think like the show is called the curiosity project and I've answered curiosity enough times. I'm not going to answer it now, but it is really important to me. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I think that it's, I think I'm going to steal yours. Uh, I think laughter. Uh, I think recently laughter and the people who make me laugh and value my ability to make them laugh. Cause that's just something I'm like very valued for in yeah. my personal day to day. Right. Like my brothers, I'm like, wow, you're incredible. Cause you make me laugh. But my friends and like the people that surround me that love me for my ability to make people laugh the thing I love in myself, that's that's incredible. I value that so much. And I value like having a joke send me into <laughs> stitches beyond like just like you know I know people that are just so funny that like one sentence and I'm 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 laughing and there's nothing I can do to control that. Yeah. And yeah. I value that so so much. So I've stolen one of yours, but those are my hey, answers. Oh, good! Please steal away, steal away. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me a memory that shaped you. Oh man, um, these do get easier. I swear. No, no, I like. <laughs> I like sorry, there's a helicopter setting. It's about to land on my house. Uh, a memory that shaped me. I would say for me, uh, and I think this probably popped into my mind. My mind because you were just talking about your grandfather, but. Um, I remember very distinctly, my grandfather was a, a, a very funny man and a very joyful man, which is amazing because he was a, a Holocaust survivor and had a, by all accounts, a pretty traumatic start to his life. And I think could have really held on to that. And the fact that he was just sort of like mirthful, happy person um, was pretty inspiring to me when I was a kid. And I will always remember he took me to go see uh, Terry Gilliam's um, The Adventures of uh, Baron von Munchausen. Um, and I loved the film. The film like blew me away, but there was something about seeing it with him and having that experience with him and hearing him laugh at these jokes. And there's, you know, it's, it's, it's not really a kid's movie. It's kind of dark and violent at times. It's also like, amazingly creative and colorful and and weird and just hearing how his enjoyment and being a part of that uh it really shaped me and it really made me want to create create movies to have that experience for myself and also create that for other people to and so there's something for me still when i sit in a theater of people and they're enjoying something i made there's no greater high than that for me and I think a lot of that goes back to those early experiences of seeing movies um, especially with him just because he was such a <laughs> he if he was enjoying himself everybody in the theater would know it he was making a lot of noise with his laughter and and there's something very nice about that for me and comforting for me in remembering that tell me in as much detail as you can about something you knew of which once existed and now does not something I know of which once existed and now does not uh, okay, there's a place. So growing up um, in, I grew up in Denver, Colorado, and uh, growing up, there was a place that I have very distinct memories of going to when I was a kid. Um, and then it, it eventually, it's not there anymore. It got knocked down. It was a place called, I believe it was called and I don't think this is actually what it was called because this is like a Scientology thing in Los Angeles. But I feel like it was called the Celebrity Center, I think. But it was this amazing place that had arcade games, a bowling alley, um, uh, and a massive like water park sort of thing where it was indoor, an indoor pool, a giant indoor pool, and then these incredible slides that you could walk up like 
six flights of ramps and then slide down these slides that kind of went outside the building. And I have such uh, very, very detailed memories of this place growing up, which was uh, both really good memories because I had like amazing times there with friends and playing games and um, all of these things. And then also like really terrible memories because um, I was a very big kid and I dreaded taking off my shirt in public. And uh, so I, you know, going to the swimming pool was always like kind of fraught with all of this tension for me. And I actually got into a fight once there because a kid made fun of me. And I'll never forget because I, <laughs> my go-to when I used to get in fights, because I used to get in fights when I was a kid, was to kick. Because nobody sees a kick coming when you're a kid. Everyone thinks you're going to throw a punch and then you kick them and you just, you know, you get them. But I was standing in like thigh deep water and just went into my kick instinct and you can't kick in water and it did not work out so well for me. So I have a lot of like very formative childhood memories of this place um, that I can't remember the name of. It's not Celebrity Center. Now I want to do research and find it because I haven't thought about that place in years. I don't even know why it popped into my head, but it doesn't exist anymore. It got knocked down and now it's a grocery store. Question six is what do you suck at? Oh man, so many things. <laughs> uh, I suck at uh, communicating um, with friends. That is my, uh, and, and it's probably at the front of my mind because it's something that I'm, uh, I'm currently in therapy. Uh, highly recommend it for anyone considering uh, going to therapy. Um, but for me, one of the big things I work on, I tend to disappear. I tend to like go up my tree, as my mom says. Um, you know, a lot of times it's it sort of starts when I'm focused on a project because I really put everything into that. Um, but I think also that's kind of an excuse that I use at times. And so there are a lot of friendships I have or people who mean a great deal to me who are in my thoughts a lot, um, but I'm terrible at reaching out. I'm terrible at staying in contact. I'm terrible at returning um, emails or text messages at times. And there's kind of an anxiety there for me. So it's something that I'm uh, not good at, but also very motivated to get better at, which, you know, if I'm gonna talk about something I'm terrible at, I'd rather be something that I'm working on trying to get better at. And what are you great at? Oh man. Uh, <laughs> I, I think I'm pretty great at, um, and this goes back to the to question number two. I think I'm pretty good at being creative. Um, or no, you said great. I'm gonna say I'm gonna repeat it back. I'm pretty. I'm great at being creative. Uh, um, and I think just because for me, it's it's a way to. I really like challenges. I really like to make things interesting um, and kind of difficult on myself. So I'm always trying to challenge myself to be creative, and so I have a lot of practice at it. And so. Yeah, I think I'm just, I, I like bringing fresh ideas to whatever I'm working on. What do you suck at and, and are great at? I suck at, um, I suck at managing my own anxiety. I think I was pretty good at it before. I think COVID has kind of taken that away from me. COVID fucked I, everybody up on that. Yeah, yeah. I think I yeah. get quite worked up on things that I can't control. Um, and I... I'm not in therapy for that, and I should be. Um, yeah. But I I find myself constantly like getting very anxious around things that are kind of nonsensical. Um, like I'm going on a trip in a few days to the US uh, to see my girlfriend and a few friends, and I'm nice. really excited about it. But to get into the United States, you have to get a COVID test. You have to get a negative COVID oh. test. And I'm a bit of a hermit, so it's not me I'm kind of worried about when my family does like social events they go in, like into the city and they go out and nights out and stuff and i'm like ah ah and there's nothing i can do about it like what am i supposed to do? tell them to not live their lives now yeah. no but yeah i do get anxious and like i'm worried about them giving me covid before i go on this trip and then me giving it to all my friends and stuff but that's like how many steps did i have to take to get there you know i had to take like six or seven steps mentally to get to that point and right. I don't think like it's something to be necessarily concerned about. One needs to be worried about the global pandemic, but 
I also need to realize what is in the scope of my control and what is not. Um, and also within like social anxieties of like, oh, does this person like me? Am I being annoying? Um, am, am I a pest? And the answer most times, no, you're fine. Yeah. People yeah. like you. Um, but um, that's why, like, again, trying to exercise, because I'm generally like one of my values for, and still is one of my strongest values is kindness. And I'm very good at being kind to other people and like giving them opportunities to be fully and wholly themselves without ever affording myself that opportunity. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So yeah, I, I that's what I suck at. I need to be more kind to myself. Um, what I'm great at is I think I think I am pretty great at talking. I think I'm pretty great at communicating and like being honest and open and like putting all my cards on the table and and letting people judge what that whatever the case may be whatever they think of it um and i think that resonates with a lot of people and that i think that's why i'm good at communicating because people respect because there's a lot of shit that goes into being social yeah uh, <laughs> there's a lot of like unnecessary uh, like scaffolding and frameworks around like oh i have to say this and i have to do that and i kind of don't and um, I am the sort of person that sends people messages to be on an interview show. So you kind of have to lose that very quickly. Yeah. Um, and so I, I think I'm very good at communicating. I mean, no, I'm going to follow you. I'm great. I am great. There you at go. Communicating. There you yeah. go. Yeah. I'm, you got to own it. Yeah. Gotta I'm great it. at communicating and I'm great at giving people the opportunity to be themselves and be yeah. kind. And, and these are things that I am great at. Um, I love that question because it's it it is part of that mission to be kinder. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So. It's good to give people an opportunity to tell you what they're great at. I think mm -hmm. that's a, and it's something I think um, a lot of us now I think are kind of conditioned to uh, not do that to not like acknowledge our greatness sometimes or or like just be like, hey, I'm great at this thing. Like you know, we have this sort of like idea of humility kind of built into us that I think it makes it like awkward and uncomfortable for a lot of people to say like that so I think it's a great question to get people to open up thank you yeah. um I I was especially excited to ask you that question because like I during the start of the pandemic when things were like really tough I think I watched every single episode of Key and Peele <laughs> <laughs> like it, uh, 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 and I watched like, I actually didn't know this until you, uh, that I was, like, just, like, making sure you were the person that I thought you were. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Looking up your IMDb and stuff, which was that you also directed an episode of Twilight uh, Zone, which is another I did. fucking incredible show. Oh, um, that's awesome. Yeah. yeah. You're, you're one of the few who's seen it. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's it's Jordan Peele. Um, I mean, yeah. 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 I, I was super excited when he asked me to do it. And uh, I love the original Twilight Zone so much. And that was honestly, I think actually making that that episode was like one of, if not the highlight of my directing career, just because of how much fun it was to work on that show. It really was fulfilling in so many ways. Yeah, like, I, I I did see it. I'm actually not much of a horror person. I got really into horror during the pandemic. Yeah. Um, like, dipping my toe in. I'm a bit of a weenie. Um, but <laughs> I, I watched the Twilight Zone because I'd seen, like, uh, there's clips all over YouTube of the old, like, really old Twilight Zone. And, sure. you know, it's such a cultural staple that you kind of have to. And you watch the new and you're like, oh, this takes the new, uh, the old concepts that scared the crowd people, the people liked, the challenge it, this kind of, this is not accurate, but it the Star Trek style of challenging expectation. Yeah. It's, yeah, it's slightly different, but you know what I mean. Yeah. Um, and it uses those themes in new ways to reflect modern society and does it differently from things that are like Black Mirror and like, because, I don't know, Black Mirror can sometimes be like technology bad. And I'm not, yeah. I'm yeah. not like, Technology good, actually. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, I don't know. I, I am a huge fan of... I actually didn't know that you had done that, though. Because um, I'm a huge fan of Jordan Peele and, like, you know, Austin sure. and all, all that stuff. Um, and when I saw it, I was like, wow, okay, well, that's another thing. Yeah, that's really cool. Um, 
Yeah, it's a, what fascinates you? Um, gosh, a lot. Uh, <laughs> you know, just like talking to people, getting to know people's stories. I feel like every single person that you interact with um, is interesting. There's, I don't, I do not believe there's such a thing as a boring person. Like, you know, someone may not present well, or they may not put their best foot forward, or they may not like open up about what's interesting about them right off the bat. But I honestly find if you talk to people and you're open to listening to what they have to say and you give them, I, for whatever reason, um, and my wife is the same way, I, I'm, I'm really good at getting information out of people that in hindsight, I'm like, oh, I can't believe they just told me that. Um, it's kind of amazing. And so um, I really just enjoy talking to people because I find that that's one of the things I love about my job is I get to go places and and see things I wouldn't otherwise get to see and meet people I wouldn't otherwise get to meet. And I've met some amazing people who are just fascinating people. And um, so I, you know, to me, that's like the super just fun brain nourishing part of what I do is, is meeting people and getting to know them and, and hearing their interesting stories and hearing their, their weird stories or their crazy adventures or their shocking thing that they've never told anyone or shocking thing that they tell everybody i don't it doesn't matter i just i find that fascinating 100 percent, 100 percent. that's my answer you're so in the right question. line of work for doing that so yeah, <laughs> yeah that's um, one, i can't give you my answer you've given it um <laughs> i've said on this show before everyone's interesting i don't care who you yeah. are everyone is uh, and everyone has something cool to tell uh, have you ever watched the show uh nathan for you I have, I have actually seen that. Yes. So, yeah, I love that show. And and that shows, you know, it's very funny. And he does, you know, these kind of elaborate um, social hoax construct. I don't know. But, but what I really love about that show is that he clearly has such a talent for getting people to give up insane information. Like, the, I don't know if you've seen the episode where he's like at a gas station. I think he's trying to do a promotion where... If someone hikes up a mountain, they get a, a you know a lifetime of free gas or something like that. But he's talking to this gas station owner, and somehow it comes out that the gas station owner drinks his five-year-old nephew's urine because he believes it's good for him, and he just gives that information up. And I'm like, what? <laughs> like <laughs> he thinks that's so normal that he's just telling this. And so there's something about Nathan Fielder where he gets people to just open up the craziest shit and and i love that so I, I love that quality in that show anyway it just reminded me of it but, but. <laughs> i've seen three episodes of that show my friend tim is just a huge fan of that show and i've seen three episodes but i've been like oh, i've been meaning to watch more we don't have hbo max here though so oh uh, really it's on hbo max there? yeah yeah oh uh, it's on comedy central here oh yeah um, but that would be one not that i advocate uh piracy but if, there, if you're ever in a situation where you can download that show or, or stream it, however you can, I believe in a freedom of, if it's not available legally, then you got to do what you got to do. Yeah. Um, like I, most, everything I release, um, like my show, the RPGs and stuff, most of it, like not recently because because like I'm trying to fund like stuff, but like most of everything I release is free. And if people don't want to give me money that's totally fine uh yeah. but i'm i'm also like if i can get it legally and if i can afford it yeah absolutely i will pay because yeah. people deserve the the actual uh return on their hard work um but like i know for a fact that in certain countries it's maybe even illegal to access certain things and like i think yeah. i've spoken to about enough people that I can pretty confidently say people want you to watch their stuff rather than not watching it that's exactly right. That's exactly yeah. right. I would much rather, you know, obviously I would, I, I'm in the business of, of selling things that I make and I would much rather people pay for them. And um, it's how I survive. But at the same time, if I put all of this emotional energy into something that I make, I'd mostly just like people to watch it, you know, yeah. enjoy it, like however that happens. So, yeah. you know, you please can't pay. Get... If you can't, then, you know, then you can't. Yeah. But yeah. Can, you should. That's yeah. My, well, that's yeah I, I, i'm in the same boat um this next question is kind of related which is what piece of media should everyone consume 
Oh man. Um, uh, that's a good question. It's always the recommendation ones. People, people tell me about what fascinates them, about memories and stuff, but recommendations get them. Yeah, I mean, that's a big thing to say that everyone should consume this one, this one thing. Uh, I'm trying to think of what's really like moved me or inspired me. Um, man. Uh, well, God, it's hard to, you know, it's hard to think of something that is like universal enough to say that like everyone should watch or consume this thing or experience this thing. But um, I guess for me, the thing that's popping into my mind right now is a film, uh, but it's not one that I think everybody should necessarily watch. It just happened to move me quite a bit. So maybe that's not the best example. Give me yours. That might Maybe that'll inspire some. This one, I never have had an answer before, but I actually do have an answer now. Yeah. Um, it's a book called What I Talk About When I Talk About Running by Haruki Murakami, who is like a very famous author um i don't think everyone will like it but it's short enough that i think everyone should consume it because it's only about 100 pages long and it's about anything creative right it's about like it is this very long winded it's a true like it's an autobiography about him running marathons because he loves running marathons but it's also like this really close to life allegory of what it means to be creative and like on a day-to-day basis run the marathon of creativity but i'm gonna write it down because i want to i want to read it uh what what i talk about when i talk about running and it's there's some incredible stories in there and there is just like it's very moving the book is um but again it's super short so it doesn't do anything uh, yeah. but it, i related to it so much that like at the time i was re- i read this book like almost three years ago now when I was at the height of my examinations in college and it's just a day anything and anyone that struggles with like the day-to-day slog of anything even if you love it especially if you love it because he loves writing but you still run you're still running a marathon i think that's the book yeah yeah all right that's really good yeah i'm going to i wouldn't say steal your answer (laughs) But I'm going to be directly inspired by your answer and say that there is a book because I didn't consider books and that's a really good way to go. Um, uh, There's a book that I read. uh, It's a very popular book. A lot of people have read it. Um, But for anyone, especially anyone who is looking to get into, I think it applies to any kind of creative pursuit similarly, but especially writing. Um, Stephen King wrote a book called On Writing, which is just about the act of writing and the work of writing and the practice of just it's, it's very writing focused, but I found it to be an incredibly inspiring book just for like developing tools to nurture creativity, developing tools to like fit the way that you work. Um, It was really an inspiring book for me in a lot of ways as a creative person. So um, thanks for the inspiration. I appreciate that. Hell yeah. (laughs) I've also wrote down your book. I've never read it. So great. We'll read each other's books. I like it. (laughs) Thank you. Uh, This next question is, and I mean this, my favorite question in this entire show. I love all the other ones, but this one I love the most. Okay. Uh, Which is, if you could name a hot sauce, what would you call it and why? Ooh, that is a really good question. I'm also obsessed with uh, hot ones. Yes. uh, Which is like the best, which also... Interestingly enough, and your questions kind of recall hot ones. I think he's a, re- a remarkably good interviewer, at least in terms of like the questions that he asked. Um, I agree. Uh, so kudos, I th- you're 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 doing a fantastic job. But um, thank you. If I was made a hot sauce, it would be. Uh, 
Oh my God, I'm I'm sorry. I'm, my brain is is only going in inappropriate places. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, I've always liked. I, I don't know if you're familiar with the. Um, and there probably is a hot sauce called this. I'm going to Google it after this and find out. But uh, I, when I was a kid, I was really obsessed with like the Cold War and like Russia and like just it to me, it was because I, I was old enough to remember the Cold War while it was still going on. And then it was just over. And it was like, oh, no, never mind. You don't have to worry about that anymore. And it was a very strange thing for me when I was a kid. So I was really obsessed with Russia and stuff. And I got really into learning about um uh, the DEFCON ratings. And so like DEFCON one, two, three, four, and DEFCON five was like nuclear war is imminent. So I would probably call my hot sauce DEFCON five. Okay. That's really cool. It's like a nuclear bomb is about to go off in your mouth. <laughs> Try this hot sauce. Following the spiritual design philosophy of all hot sauce needs to sound fucking insane. Yeah, I like right? It. it all yeah. has to sound like murderous and conjure <laughs> images of death and horror. And I love spicy food, but I don't know why they got to get so violent with the imagery. Yeah, well, you're going full nuclear war. I, I am. I'm, I'm <laughs> it's terrible. Uh, uh, what's your hot sauce name? I got to know. When I started this question, I my go-to answer for for literal for like the entirety of the show has always been hedgehog's kiss because hedgehogs <laughs> can't if you kiss a hedgehog first of all ow you know but hedgehogs can't actually kiss each other because of their spikes, and which is a kind of sad fact. That is sad. Yeah, but uh, hedgehog's kiss. Um, hedgehog's but kiss. I like that. I I have been recently considering like branching out a little bit um and i think like a really nice like barbecue smoky hot sauce called saddle rash would be really cool <laughs> so like i'm not saying that people need to help me make the saddle rash oh, hot sauce. Man. i like that i make, i kind of want to change my answer to assless chaps <laughs> <laughs> like there's a lot of ways you can go maybe it's going to blow your actual ass off and you'll become an assless chap. I don't know, but <laughs> chap is a nice one too. I like this. Saddle rash. <laughs> I would definitely pick up a bottle of saddle rash. Yeah. Thank oh, you. Good. Yeah. I'm, I'm a big fan of like the way that sends people's minds like that question. Yeah. Like, have you genuinely, have you ever considered what you call a hot sauce before? Probably no, not. Yeah. Never. Um, <laughs> and I just, I just love it. Um, <laughs> what is your most prized physical possession? You know, it is a, I'm actually, it's right up there. It is an eight millimeter uh, projector that my grandfather gave me. He gave me um, the projector and then all of these canisters of uh, vacation film that he shot on eight millimeter film with my family. And I would say in the event of, uh, of a DEFCON 5 type situation, I'd be grabbing that projector and throwing it in the car to take with me wherever I go because it is very precious to me. What strange thing has informed your creative work? Oh, that's interesting. This, this is sort of a complicated answer but it's definitely a i don't know if it counts as a, a strange thing but it's it's a psychological thing and it's a theme in my work or in the types of projects i'm drawn to that i only recently sort of realized so uh i am really drawn to um uh stories about hiding an identity or hiding a true self or, or um, people with kind of a, a put on identity that they sort of have to wear out in public versus be who they really are inside. And uh, that has sort of become a theme of what I do. It's, it's very much what we did on Key and Peel. You know, that show was about identity. And I think in a lot of ways, you know, it, it kind of often gets pointed to as a show more about race but really when we were making it the conversation for us was more about identity and, and and specifically masculinity and kind of the mask of masculinity that people wear um in order to feel like they fit in 
and so many of our best sketches were about like guys who were just terrified of being vulnerable or being non-masculine in some way and sort of poking fun at that farce because it is farcical and I think that's really what Keegan and Jordan um, were so strong at was sort of like you know lampooning hyper masculinity or, or lampooning kind of the theatrics of masculinity um, and then you know that sort of carried across into I love anything with spies and espionage because to me that's sort of like you have your real identity and then you have this identity that you have to put on even the last movie I did which isn't out yet um, called The Machine is about uh, this comedian, Burt Kreischer, who's very much known for being this party animal. And, you know, he's always like drinking his face off and that's what his fans love. And the movie is really about him struggling with that identity and, and, and not wanting to do that anymore and realizing that it's actively harming his family, but not knowing how to reconcile that. So for me, I think because I grew up, um, I had a lot of, uh, issues of not really feeling like I belonged or, or feeling out of place. Um, identity kind of became this very malleable thing for me. It sort of was like, oh, I can kind of chameleon in whatever environment I'm in to just sort of disappear. I was always most comfortable just sort of disappearing, blending in, not standing out. Um, and so that's, that's really inspired me creatively because there's something really fascinating to me about stories where people, um, either do that by choice or have to do it uh, because they're, they're forced to. Um, and, and then it's, that's the struggle for them. And so um, I don't, yeah, I, I've actually forgotten the original <laughs> question. So I hope I answered it. You did. Uh, okay, you did. great. Good. You answered it perfectly. The, the question was, what strange thing informs your creative work, which strange thing informs me. That, that's the strange thing that informs my creative work the most, uh, most directly. Yeah, and it's, uh, of course, me, like, as a trans person, would know nothing about hidden identity, ever. Like, <laughs> but it doesn't come up in my life, generally. Um, yeah, yeah, no, I can't see the connection at all. To yeah, that. yeah. Um, <laughs> I will say, my, one of my, which is really funny that I never, I never actually view, viewed Kim Peel as a show about race. I, I did always view it about, as a show about masculinity. My, my favorite sketch in the show is, so I love Dungeons and Dragons. I love it. <laughs> And the Duns and Dragons sketch where everyone else is taking it super seriously and the one dude is like, nah, I want to fucking stab him. <laughs> That's incredible. <laughs> Every time I watch it, I lose my mind. I'm like, I know I have had you at my table, you bastard. <laughs> uh, yeah, so I, I never... I, I actually didn't know there was a discussion around Key and Peele and Race. I always... Oh, yeah. Like, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. Okay. I mean, I think because... You know, and this is probably especially an American thing, because I think in America, we sort of hyper focus on race so often. But I think because they're biracial and because Comedy Central, their biggest hit was Chappelle's show, which which I think did explicitly deal with race a little bit more. Um, certainly in our first season, the show was very much advertised as kind of exploring race and racial issues. Uh, definitely the network was kind of pushing us to explore racial issues. That was kind of what they wanted the show to be about. Um, and I think it was sort of a process of really Keegan and Jordan having to be like, no, no, we're going to make the show about what inspires us and what we want to make it about. And it's not necessarily going to be limited to that. But I, I think that um, a lot of people who wrote the show off early on, we're like, ah, it's a show about race. And like, ah, they're just like black people, white people, they're so different. And like, eh. And I think that um, that just really, yeah, it just is, it, it's, the show's a lot more nuanced than that. But I think that there's still a little bit of the stigma of that, again, at least in the, in the, in the States to this day. Yeah. Wow. That's, uh, that's really, really interesting. I mean, like my exposure comes through like YouTube and Comedy Central posting all the sketches on, on YouTube and watching and like then the shows coming on our networks during syndication like late night stuff yeah um, and wow. i'm glad the original intent made it made made it through. i i, I almost feel <laughs> like the number of people who uh it's 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 all it's honestly really cool to hear that because i feel like most people who i talk to even if they're big fans of the show they don't necessarily kind of put that together so it's it's cool that that really yeah, well, 
I almost feel bad, like <laughs> that I never even detected the like that theme. That it's just like, it does that just not? Did I just not pick up on that? Is that a bad thing? Should I maybe? I mean, I no, like, no, not at all. No, not at all. No, no. Yeah. The themes were very much, much more identity and masculinity. I mean, that was really the thesis of the show. In a lot of way, it was really about poking fun at toxic masculinity. I mean, that was kind of the overarching thesis of the show. Like for me, another one of the sketches I loved is like the dude who doesn't laugh he, yeah. he laughs but he doesn't laugh LeBron and, can't laugh yeah 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 <laughs> uh, like the whole point of that i didn't i didn't see that as like oh this is uh you know black people laugh and this was like no there's a dude who's actively stancing in front of his friends because he doesn't understand the joke and he doesn't yeah. get it and yeah. i guess i guess it's because i live in a very sheltered white like 98 percent of ireland is white so the the themes of the show that i picked up on are very different than the 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 themes that like people in a society more consumed by race would necessarily focus on i do think maybe it is a slight indictment that i didn't pick up on it even a little bit but that's that's on me uh I, i still I still really like the show. So yeah, good, good. <laughs> um, did you ever have an epiphany? If so, what was that about? Man, I feel like I have a, a lot of epiphanies. Um, the question is, do they seek in enough for me to learn something from them? Um, uh, you know, I I think that like that's sort of the the really fun part of doing a creative pursuit is I find that I can find out a lot about myself through what I'm doing and, and what I'm working on. And I have kind of the benefit of like, you know, most, most people, you know, you do a, a job or you do something and kind of like, that's it, you move on. And for me, um, it's nice to go back and revisit stuff occasionally that I haven't watched in a long time. Cause it's a little bit of an insight to where I was mentally and emotionally at that time, you know? And, and so I get these nice little time capsules and I go, oh, oh, that's what I was dealing with. I, I was totally, you know, in denial about that. But that's, I was totally going through some shit when I was working on that. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think I, I get the luxury of a lot of epiphanies um, about myself or just about kind of like my, like we talked about values, about my values through that. Um, the trick for me is processing that and then like, progressing or not repeating the same mistakes which i find that i do a lot but i i'm i'm curious to get your answer on the same question i mean uh so epiphanies well i could go with the obvious one about like gender i'm not gonna do that um i think for me you've made me question it ah um <laughs> I don't know what I'm doing. That's my big epiphany as of late. I want to be an actress. I want to work in creative. I, like I want to make movies. I want to do TV. I want to do. I don't know how to do any of that. I don't even know what I don't know. I like I I can do the way I started the Curiosity Project was I looked up how to make uh like, what do I need to make a show? And I, the first episodes of the show, if you go back and listen to them, are recorded, like, on my phone. Like, there's a Zoom meeting going on, and I'm recording it next to my phone. <laughs> um, then, for, like, my TTRPG stuff that I'm, I'm writing, I don't know how to do that either. And I'm just kind of fucking winging it. But there's no... Because of the amount of energy and the amount of people you need, there's kind of no way to wing making tv and there's no way to wing being an actor and there's no way to wing like you could just do it you could make stuff but that's i don't know what i don't know and oh, my, yeah, go ahead go ahead yeah, go ahead my biggest epiphany is that like i want to know like i i this has only been the last two months especially with the fallout from my grandfather being like oh he probably didn't have a lot of unrealized dreams but Everyone, when they die, have have unrealized dreams. And I don't want any of my insane 70 ideas that I have in my head to go unrealized. I want to give them all the energy and attention, to quote uh, a previous guest on on the show, 
um, a, a, that they all deserve. Yeah. And I don't, I don't know. And that's exciting, but I'll let me, uh, can I, maybe this will put you at ease slightly, or maybe it will uh, terrify you. And I'm sorry, either way, <laughs> but I, I think you're both very correct about that. And also uh, completely wrong in that I, I think you can just wing it because I think that that is, I am a director. I directed big projects, little projects, TV, commercials, whatever. I'm, I wing it every day. You know, there is no, there is no correct proven methodology of like, this is how you do it. Here are the steps. Here's how you achieve that. Here's how you do it in practice. Now go out and do it. If that knowledge existed, um, certainly it'd be make my life a lot easier and a lot less stressful, but um, it doesn't. And, and you, you know, part of it really, I think the hardest part is just kind of throwing caution to the wind and, and, and doing it. And to that point, like, I think that there's no such thing as starting too small. You know, I think that like, you'd never know what is going to work. You never know what's going to pay off. You never know what somebody's going to see and be like, oh, that's cool. We should talk about doing something else. You just don't know. And I think that um, you just have to wing it every day. And then eventually maybe somebody pays you to do it and then you're just doing it and you're still going, oh, I hope they don't find out. I don't, I'm not really qualified. Like no one, you know, no one ever said like, congratulations, you're a director or you're a writer. It just happens. And then you got to kind of keep making it happen. So, you know, I hope that's encouraging only in so much as like, don't worry too much about like the quest for knowledge of how to do something. If you want to do it and it's your passion and it interests you, try to do it in, in as many small ways as you can find. The how is like, what opportunities are around you or within reach that you can do? Community theater is a great place to start. Um, you know, you can just go to general open calls for things. You can also be a background extra for film and television, which is a great way to just, you know, experience it and see it firsthand and, and be around it. But I would really strongly encourage you to, I think that the with any creative pursuit, creating your own opportunities is kind of the best way to get your foot in the door. And especially if you want to write and direct, finding ways to just scratch that itch of acting. If there's a monologue that you love, if there's a scene that you love, if you want to write something um, that expresses a character that you want to be and just put it out there, you know, that's sort of the, I think the best thing about YouTube and the world we live in is just like, you can put it out there and people can watch it and it's terrifying and also amazing. What's just the best feeling? Oof. Well, I, I, it's a cheat because I already kind of said it, but for me, the best feeling that I experience there, like to filmmaking is kind of the closest I get to like magic. I get to like actually make magic where like you can put a series of images in the right order and it will make people feel things and it will tell them a story and you can experience that. That, that to me is like, it's alchemy. And so when I put a ton of work into something and, and you know, spend time conceptualizing it and then planning for it and then capturing it, however we capture it, and then putting it together and then putting music on it and color timing it and sound mixing it. And then you get to watch, be in a room where people are experiencing that and going through whatever emotional and story journey you're taking them on. Um, there's no, there's no better feeling for me. That's really that those like, especially in a theatrical setting where it's a group of people sharing a communal space and it's the lights are out and they're staring at, you know, a, image flickering 24 times a second on the screen and they're having an emotional experience whether it's laughter or fear or 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 excitement or tension all of those things man it's just the juice that's like the best thing in the world um that or having your son hug you one of the two it's one those two the, those yeah. are the two best things <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I love that question. 
I love that question. What's your What's your favorite? What's oh, your What's your thing? Uh, I think we've got two, which yeah. is I think I mentioned earlier, which is like it, the feeling of knowing you're making memories. Yeah. Like positive, good, happy memories where everyone around you is just laughing in the world. Like ambrosia drips from the walls of the world. It's like awesome. I love that. Uh, and the second one is when the weather is warm in Ireland. If you take a stroll into, the, I, I, I live in the countryside, so I can just kind of walk out the door and it's there. And walking in and near like fields of like wheat or um, just fields of grass and with like the buzzing of the hedge grows and everything that you're like, this is heaven. This is what heaven is if it's anything. And that is just the best feeling of it's warm. It doesn't get warm enough that it's in like, oh, I am overheating or intoxicating. It's just warm enough that you, yeah. you can wear shorts and it's, it's okay. Everything has had enough rain recently that it's just green enough that it's beautiful. The ground is hard enough that you walk on it and it's stable under your feet. It's not mucky. There's buzzing of creatures. You know, there's just enough noise that it's still peaceful. Incredible. Yeah. Yeah. I, I like it. it. <laughs> That's a, you talk about making memories and that feeling of that awareness of you're creating a, or you're in a moment that's going to be a special memory. I, have you ever heard the story of the devil's pocket watch? No. Uh, so there's a story, I forget the origin of it, but it's kind of an old folk tale of, um, a guy who makes a deal with the devil um, for a pocket watch that can freeze time. And so he spends his whole life, you know, he has these amazing moments and every time he has kind of this amazing, wonderful moment, he's tempted to freeze time and be in that moment forever. But he's always worried that there's going to be a better moment that comes along. And so he never does. And on his deathbed, the, devil takes back his pocket watch and says nobody ever uses it because you're always worried it's not the right moment um and so for me that story has always stuck with me for some reason so there are moments from time to time where i am in a situation and i realize oh my god this is going to be a very special memory like you're saying and i always think of it them as my devil's pocket watch moments where if i had the devil's pocket watch i would go you know what fuck it let's click that thing let's freeze time right here because this is a wonderful moment um and so that's just always kind of my like litmus test for like is this a moment that i'm going to love and treasure forever it's it's my devil's pocket watch moment that's really cool i <laughs> you're probably get, like you'll visit ireland at some point and you'll hear people start talking like that's just because i'm going to keep saying devil's pocket watch around until everyone around me is saying it and you're just you're like, good, good. wait a second right. motherfucker i i saw that <laughs> <laughs> so my devil's pocket watch star. no but it's that's you know i've told a lot of people that i think it's a great kind of and it's a good reminder to like be in those moments and enjoy them and treasure them you know they are they are something to treasure there yeah <laughs> uh do you say i love you too much or too little Definitely too much. Uh, I'm I'm quick to love. <laughs> that was always a problem in relationships. Uh, you know, I guess actually I'm gonna Easter accept. I think I'm I'm quick to say it um, when I shouldn't, and I'm I don't say it enough when I should. Um, and it's a you know, it's it's a good reminder to express that to the people who mean the most to you because um it's not something that i take lightly and i kind of you know i i'm pretty tough on people and so when i really feel like i found my my person or someone that i really have a bond with or they really feel like they're my people then i really do genuinely have a lot of love for that person um, and i and then i wish i said it more what's the most valuable thing you've ever learned that nothing worth worth doing is ever easy. And I think that um, I'm an inherently lazy person. Um, I work very, very hard, but it's because I really love what I do. And because I have learned that anytime I, um, I take my foot off the gas on something, I cannot rely on the car to just drift to where it needs to go. I have to keep my foot on the gas. And so, um, I've never, I've never worked on anything where I'm at the end of it. I go, nah, 
I work too hard on that. Like I always wish I could have put even more into something. And so to me, that's kind of my reminder when I'm feeling unmotivated or feeling beat down or just tired and out of energy or whatever is kind of holding me back. I have to remember that lesson and go, nope, got to, got to do this, got to do it right. And um, it's definitely pushed me through uh, in times of, of weakness to step up and just really, you know, if you're gonna, if you're gonna take a swing, you got to really take a swing. Um, and that's been a valuable lesson for me. How do you feel about death? Mm, curious. Um, I've always had a fascination with death. Um, when I was a kid, um, death was fascinating to me. Um, and it, it, there's an intrigue about death. Um, I think for me, it's just, you know, consciousness is obviously so powerful. Um, and the idea I've had people close to me die, um, and, and people I've cared about very deeply die. And so, you know, I'm a very kind of, I'm a skeptical, logic infatuated person. Um, and so I'm not a religious person per se, but, uh, at the same time, I feel a connection with people who have died where it is comforting to go, Oh, well, maybe there's some remnant of them after death. And I think that even if that remnant only really exists within me, um, you know, I, I find that death is always something I've been uh, not like eager to experience, but at the same time, I'm not really afraid of it because to me, there's so many questions involved with it. There's so much wondering what the experience of death feels like um, that whenever it happens for me, whether it's in 40 years or next Tuesday, um, there's going to be a part of me you know, whatever kind of last little bits of consciousness I'm hanging on to where I go, okay, I get to, I get to find out, I get to like, see what all the fuss is about. Uh, and there's something kind of nice about that. And so um, I have this sort of a little bit of a detached relationship with death, because while yes, it's incredibly sad when people die, because um, I will miss them. And, and it's painful. There's also kind of like a a fascination with it or, or just a, uh, you know, I, I'm just like, wow, I, I, I it's interesting to me. Um, yeah. What are you most proud of? It's, it's hard for me not to um, tie it into my work because my work is so important to me. Um, and there's so many things that I've, that I've, done in that regard that I am proud of for my own reasons. But I think it's honestly um, my son. Like that's the thing that to, I, like I made a person with another <laughs> and uh, he's pretty cool. And, <laughs> and all that it, the only materials involved were stuff in our bodies. Uh, and that's, it's incredibly bizarre when you're going through that. You're like, wait, what? We just, we had sex and now there's a person like that's where people come from. And it happens <laughs> all the time. Every, we're all from that, but it's still such a deeply insane thing to experience that um, I have a great deal of pride that like, we just, we made a person who I love very much. And like, I could do fuck all for the rest of my life. And I still made him and he's doing all right. And I'm, I'm a decent enough parent that I'm not like, I don't think knock on wood, I'm going to send it up, but I don't think I'm fucking him up too much. And um, I feel pretty good about that. What's the best thing that's happened to you this week? Wow. Um, this week, <laughs> it's been a, actually a tough week. Uh, <laughs> that's going to take a second to think of something good. Uh, no, that's not true. Um, the best thing that's happened to me this week, let me, I'm going to look at a calendar only because it's going to help 
me remind me what's happened in the last week. Uh, okay, I went and saw, this is a, a silly trivial thing, but it's, it's on my calendar and it was a good thing that happened to me this week. Um, I randomly checked a movie theater's website looking at movie show times. I saw that they were playing a movie that I love that I haven't seen in a very long time. Uh, and I was like, you know what? I'm going to go to a movie at two o'clock in the afternoon. And I went and I saw Michael Mann's uh, Collateral, which I hadn't seen in a long time. And it was great. And I, I love seeing any movie in theaters. I mean, I, I, I see two or three movies a week easily in movie theaters and many more at home. But um, seeing that movie in the big, you know, unexpectedly during the week on the big screen was like a wonderful treat. It just like was like, oh, this is great. And it was at a, this theater, Alamo Draft House, that like serves food. And it was great. It was a really wonderful, just like little treat to myself in the middle of the week. Really nice. If you were on a starship, what position would you hold? Uh, I've been playing a lot of, I don't know if you play many video games, but, um, I've recently kind of got back into PC games and I've been playing, um, Elite Dangerous. Oh, I love Elite Dangerous. I yeah. love, yeah. I, so first funny. time for me, I'm really into it. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, and my favorite thing to do, which I guess this is sort of my answer, the type of Starship experience I would want to cultivate is, um, I would love to be a space trucker. I have, there's no greater feeling in that game than like just loading up something for delivery into my spaceship, fucking putting, you know, putting the coordinates in, you know, maybe smoking a joint, putting on some music. I, I weirdly listen to country music while I play that game. <laughs> I just do some space trucking and like just fucking jumping into hyperspace and navigating and going to, and like, there's really a lot of joy in that for me of just like taking a load to somebody and getting a little money for it and just living a life on the road in outer space. So <laughs> I would love to be a space trucker if that qualifies as it an does. The question. It does. I've been doing that lately. <laughs> if you could give just one piece of advice, what would that be? Well, I'm going to go, I'm going to kind of, again, I'm, I'm cheating a lot in this, but I feel like, cause I already said it, I'm going to say, just, um, just go for it. Don't hold yourself back. Like just do, if there's something that excites you and also maybe scares you do it in whatever small way you can. And I tell that advice to, cause a lot of times I'll, I'll go like speak at film schools or stuff like that. And people ask like, how do I become a director? And I'm like, just just do it you already are one you've got a phone with a camera on it tell a story with it and and trying stuff and failing is how you get better at whatever you want to achieve um so don't be afraid to fail <laughs> <laughs>